Greetings, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of ATP, Ask the Pastor. Dear Pastor, I've grown up a Lutheran all my life, but recently converted to Roman Catholicism. The main reason why is because of the Lutheran belief of sola scriptura. I know that the verse is quoted a lot to prove this is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, but I don't understand how you can pull sola scriptura out of it. First, it says all scripture, not only scripture is God-breathed. Also, it says that scripture is profitable or useful, but it doesn't say sufficient. Could you please help with this interpretation? Could you give me a more biblical or even a early, early church evidence that could help prove this doctrine? Absolutely. And I, help, I hope that it helps you uh, leave the fold of the Antichrist and come back. Uh, so sola scriptura, scripture alone. Uh, is, of course, then, a major emphasis of the Lutheran Reformation. Sola Scriptura is summarized um, at, at the beginning of the epitome of the formula of Concord. It says, The Holy Scriptures alone remain the only judge, rule, and standard, according to which, as the only test stone, all dogmas shall and must be discerned and judged, as to whether they are good or evil, right or wrong. So Lutherans confess this because of what Scripture says about itself. Scripture says that it is perfect. So David writes in Psalm 19 verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The word translated perfect, uh, tamima, means complete. Uh, so the word of the Lord is complete, perfect. Uh, in Jesus' parable of the rich man and Lazarus, Abraham directs the rich man's still living brothers, not to unwritten traditions, but to Moses and the prophets, that is, to the written word. St. John, at the very end of his gospel, uh, records the fact that Christ did many other signs that aren't recorded in his gospel, but these were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John 20, verse 31. The apostles' writings, therefore, contain everything that is necessary for us to believe for salvation. If scripture is perfect for converting souls, if it's complete, it doesn't need to be supplemented by unwritten traditions. You know, proper traditions are, are practices, not doctrines, and they exhibit the sufficiency of the perfect and complete word. There's no need to supplement something that is perfect and complete. Now, to, for, uh, to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, uh, we don't pull this out of these verses. These verses teach us very clearly. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, while it's true that it doesn't say only Scripture is God-breathed, what he says about the Scriptures demonstrates that Paul only has Scripture in mind as being God-breathed. And there's nothing else in all of his other epistles that would lead us to, to think of anything else outside of the word as God-breathed in this way. He describes nothing else in his epistles this way. Your main objection, though, as I see it, centers on the idea that Scripture is profitable. Now, it's true that being profitable doesn't necessarily mean being sufficient. But we have to read the entire verse in order to see what the Scripture is profitable for. That'll show us that Paul has in mind that Scripture is complete, perfect, and sufficient. And what is Scripture profitable for? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So doctrine, or teaching, includes everything that pertains to the presenting and the affirming of Christian doctrine. Reproof includes everything necessary for the uh, refutation of false doctrine. Correction is correction in morals, and instruction in righteousness means instruction in a pious and godly life as far as morals and life are concerned. Now, to what end, then, is the scripture profitable? What's the goal of the scripture's profitability? That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The word translated complete is arteos in Greek, which means sound, entire, a finished product of every limb and member. It can also then mean sufficient. Martin Chemnitz points out this when he says that the Greeks often say artioipoientuo, sufficient to do this. So if all scripture is able to make a teacher of the church, and therefore Christians, complete, that is thoroughly equipped for every good work, scripture is most certainly then sufficient to make that man complete in faith 
and life. So for St. Paul, there's no need for any source or norm for belief and behavior outside of Holy Scripture. There aren't doctrines or moral teachings that are contained in some oral tradition that runs alongside of Scripture, especially the kind of uh, ever-living and ever-developing and ever-changing tradition that the papist church holds. Uh, David, John, Paul, and Christ himself never direct people to unwritten traditions, but to the written word of God, uh, to their preaching. Uh, And their preaching then was written down in the New Testament. Now, following St. Paul uh, and others in the New Testament, then the early church also viewed Scripture as sufficient for faith and for life. And I'm glad you asked for some examples because we got a few for you. So Tertullian, in chapter 22 of Against Hermogenes, writes, uh, uh, he's, he's addressing Hermogenes' doctrine that God created the world out of a, pre-exi- a pre-existent substance. And he writes, I revere the fullness of Scripture, but whether all things were made out of any underlying matter, I have yet failed anywhere to find. Where such a statement is written, Hermogenes' shop must tell us. If it is nowhere written, then let it fear the woe which impends upon all who add to or take away from the written word. If it's not in the word, according to Tertullian, then it doesn't count and it's not from God. Uh, So written in Tertullian's uh, typical snarkiness. In the 4th century, Athanasius of Alexandria wrote in the introduction to his work against the heathen, The sacred and inspired scriptures are sufficient to declare the truth. Basil of Caesarea, one of my personal favorites among the church fathers, wrote in The Morals, uh, Summa 72, chapter 1, concerning hearers, that such hearers have been instructed in the scriptures should test what their teachers say and receive what agrees with the scriptures but reject what disagrees and sternly decline dealings with those who persist in such teachings. Later on in Summa 80, chapter 22, he writes, What is the mark of a believer? To hold fast by such conviction to the strength of what Scripture says, and to dare neither to set it not nor add to it. For if what is not of faith is sin, as the Apostle says, and faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the Word of God, then everything that is outside of the inspired Scripture, being not of faith, is sin. Basil's younger brother, Gregory of Nyssa, wrote in his work on the Holy Trinity, Let the inspired scriptures be our umpire, and the vote of truth will be given to those whose dogmas are found to agree with the divine words. Gregory of Nyssa also then writes in his treatise on the soul and the resurrection, We are not entitled to such license. I mean, that of affirming whatever we please to make the Holy Scripture, uh, we make the Holy Scriptures the rule and the measure of every tenet. We necessarily fix our eyes upon that and approve that alone, which may be made to harmonize with the intention of those writings. John Chrysostom, in homily 13 on 2 Corinthians, writes, Wherefore I exhort and entreat you all, disregard what this man and that man thinks about these things, and inquire from the scriptures all these things. In the next century, Augustine of Hippo had a lot to say about the sufficiency of scripture. In Book 2, Chapter 9 of his work on Christian doctrine, he writes, For among the things that are plainly laid down in scripture are to be found all manners that concern faith and the manner of life, to wit, hope, and love. And in his treatise on merits and the forgiveness of sin, book 2, chapter 59, he wrote, For wherever a question arises on an unusually obscure subject on which no assistance can be rendered by clear and certain proofs of the Holy Scripture, the presumption of man ought to restrain itself, nor should it attempt anything definite by leaning to either side. But if I must indeed be ignorant concerning concerning any points of the sort as to how they can be explained or proved, this much I should still believe, that from this very circumstance the Holy Scriptures would possess a most clear authority, whether, uh, whenever a point arose in which no man could be ignorant of, without impelling the salvation, imperiling the salvation uh, which has been promised to him. What he's saying is, even though there are obscure and difficult to understand portions of Scriptures, in uh, wherever there is a point of doctrine, something that we must not be ignorant of for faith and life, Scripture is entirely clear. Again, because it is perfect, it is whole, it is complete. From these selections alone, it's clear that Luther didn't invent the idea of sola scriptura. It was rather the teaching of Christ, St. Paul, St. John, and the early church fathers. I hope this go, I hope this goes a long way in helping you understand sola scriptura better, and I also then pray that it helps you abandon the unwritten, ever-developing and changing and contradictory man-made traditions of Rome.
We'll catch you next time on ATP.